Purgatory, Chapter 18 The Pains of Purgatory St. Perpetua St. Gertrude St. Catherine of Genoa Brother John de Villa As we have already said, the pains of the sense have different degrees of intensity. It is less terrible for those souls that have no grievous sins to atone for, or who, having already completed the most rigorous part of their expiation, approach the moments of their deliverance. Many of those souls suffer no more than the pain of loss, and even begin to perceive the first rays of heavenly glory, and have a foretaste of beatitude. When St. Perpetua saw her young brother Diocrates in purgatory, the child did not seem to be subjected to any cruel torture. The illustrious martyr herself writes this account of the vision in her prison at Carthage, when she was confined for the faith of Christ during the persecution under Septimus Servus in the year 205. Purgatory appeared to her under the figure of an arid desert, where she saw her brother Diocrates, who had also died at the age of seven years. The child had an ulcer in his face and tormented by thirst. He tried in vain to drink from the waters of a fountain which was before him, but the brim of which was too high for him to reach. The holy martyr understood that her brother was in a place of expiation and that he besought the assistance of her prayers. She then prayed for him, and three days later in another vision, she saw the same Diocrates in the midst of a lovely garden. His face was beautiful, like that of an angel. He was clad in a shining robe. The brink of the fountain was beneath him, and he drank copiously of those refreshing waters from a golden cup. The saint then knew that the soul of her young brother now enjoyed the bliss of paradise. We read in the revelations of St. Gertrude, a young religious of her convent, of whom she had a special love and account of her great virtues, died in the most beautiful sentiments of piety. While she was fervently recommending her dear soul to God, she was wrapped in ecstasy and had a vision. The deceased sister was shown to her standing before the throne of God, surrounded by a brilliant halo in enriched garments. Nevertheless, she appeared sad and troubled. Her eyes were cast down, as though she was ashamed to appear before the face of God. It seemed as though she would hide herself and retire. Gertrude, much surprised, asked of the divine spouse of virgins the cause of the sadness and embarrassment on the part of so holy a soul. Most sweet Jesus, she cried, why does not your infinite goodness invite your spouse to reproach you and to enter into the joy of her Lord? Why do you leave her aside, sad and timid? Then our Lord, with a loving smile, made a sign to that holy soul to draw near, but she, more and more troubled after some hesitation, all trembling, withdrew. At this sight, the saint addressed herself directly to the soul. What, my daughter? She said to her, Do you retire when your Lord calls you? You that have desired Jesus during your whole life, withdraw now that he opens his arms to receive you. Oh, my dear mother, replied the soul, I am not worthy to appear before the Immaculate Lamb. I have still some stains which I contracted upon earth. To reproach the Son of Justice, one must be as pure as a ray of light. I have not yet the degree of purity which he requires of his saints. Know that if the door of heaven were to be opened to me, I should not dare to cross the threshold before being entirely purified from all stain. It seems to me that the choir of virgins who follow the Lamb should repulse me with horror. And yet, continued the abbess, I see you surrounded with light and glory. What you see, replied the soul, is but the border of the garment of glory. To wear this celestial robe we must not retain even the shadow of sin. 
This vision shows a soul very near to the glory of heaven, but her enlightenment concerning the infinite sanctity of God was of a different order from that which has been given to us. This clear knowledge causes her to seek, as a blessing, the expiation which her condition requires to render her worthy of the vision of the thrice holy God. This is precisely the exact teachings of St. Catherine of Genoa. We know that this saint received particular light from God concerning the state of the souls in purgatory. She wrote a work entitled A Treatise on Purgatory, which has an authority equal to that of St. Teresa. In chapter 8 she thus expresses herself, The Lord is all-merciful, he stands before us, his arms extended in order to receive us into his glory. But I also see that the divine essence is of such purity, that the soul, unless it be absolutely immaculate, cannot bear the sight. If she finds herself the least atom of imperfection, Rather than dwell with a stain in the presence of the Divine Majesty, she would plunge herself into the depths of hell. Finding in purgatory a means to blot out all her stains, she casts herself into it. She esteems herself happy that, by the effect of a great mercy, a place is given to her where she can free herself from the obstacles to supreme happiness. The history of the seraphic order makes mention of a holy religious named Brother John de Villa, who died piously in a monastery in the Canary Islands. His infirmarian, Brother Ascension, was in his cell praying and recommending to God the soul of the departed, when suddenly he saw before him a religious of his order, who had appeared to be transfigured. So radiant was he that his cell was filled with a beautiful light. The brother, almost beside himself with astonishment, did not recognize him, but ventured to ask who he was and what was the object of the visit. I am, answered the apparition, the spirit of Brother John de Villa. I ask you for the prayers which you have poured forth to heaven in my behalf, and I come to ask you one more act of charity. Know that, thanks to the divine mercy, I am in a place of salvation among those predestined for heaven. The light which surrounds me is a proof of this. Yet I am not worthy to see the face of God on account of an omission which remains to be expiated. During my mortal life I omitted, through my own fault, and that several times, to recite the office for the dead, when it was prescribed by the rule. I beseech you, my dear brother, for the love you bear for Jesus Christ, to say these offices in such a manner that my debt may be paid, and I may go to enjoy the vision of my God. Brother Ascension ran to the Father Guardian, related what had happened, and hastened to say the offices required. Then the soul of the blessed John at Devia appeared again. But this time, more brilliant than before, he was in possession of eternal happiness. Purgatory, Chapter 19 The Pains of Purgatory St. Magdalene de Pazzi Sister Benedicta St. Gertrude Blessed Margaret Mary and Mother de Monteau We read in the life of St. Magdalene de Pazzi that one of her sisters, named Maria Benedicta, a religious of eminent virtue, died in her arms. During her agony she saw a multitude of angels which surrounded her with a joyful air, waiting until she should breathe forth her soul, that they might bear it to the heavenly Jerusalem, and at the moment she expired the saint saw them receiving the soul under the form of a dove, the head of which was of a golden hue, and disappear with her. Three hours later, watching and praying near the remains, Magdalene knew that the soul of the deceased was neither in paradise nor in purgatory, but in a particular place where, without suffering any sensible pain, she was deprived of the sight of God. The following day, whilst Mass was being celebrated for the soul of Maria Benedicta, 
At the Sanctus, Magdalene was again wrapped in ecstasy, and God showed her that blessed soul in the glory to which she had just been admitted. Magdalene ventured to ask our Savior why he had not allowed her this dear soul to enter sooner into his holy presence. She received for an answer that in the last sickness, Sister Benedicta had shown herself too sensitive to the cares bestowed upon her, which interrupted her habitual union with God and her perfect conformity to his divine will. Let us return to the revelations of St. Gertrude, to which we have just alluded. There we shall find another instance, which shows how, for certain souls at least, the sun of glory is preceded by a dawn which breaks by degrees. A religious died in the flower of her age, in the embrace of the Lord. She had been remarkable for the tender devotion of the Blessed Sacrament. After her death, St. Gertrude saw her, brilliant with a celestial light, kneeling before the Divine Master, whose glorified wounds appeared like lighted torches, from whence issued five flaming rays that pierced the five senses of the deceased. The countenance of the latter, however, was clouded by an expression of deep sadness. Lord Jesus, cried the saint, how comes it that whilst you thus illuminate your servant, she does not experience perfect joy? Until now, replied the good master, this sister has been worthy to contemplate my glorified humanity only, and to enjoy the sight of my five wounds, in recompense for her tender devotion to the mystery of the Holy Eucharist. But unless numerous suffrages are offered in her favor, she cannot yet be admitted into the beatific vision on account of some slight defects in the observation of her holy rules. Let us conclude that we have said concerning the nature of these pains by some details which we find in the life of Blessed Margaret Mary of the Visitation. They are taken in part from the memoir of Mother Griffier, who wisely diffident in the subject of the extraordinary graces granted to Blessed Sister Margaret, recognized the truth only after a thousand trials. Mother Philiberte Emmanuel de Monteau Superior at Ancy, died February 2nd, 1683, after a life which had edified the whole order. Mother Griffier recommended her specially to the prayers of Sister Margaret. After some time, the latter told her superior that the Lord will make known to her that this soul was most dear to him on account of her love and fidelity in his service, and that ample recompense awaited her in heaven when she should have accomplished her purification in purgatory. The Blessed Sister saw the departed in the place of expiation. Our Lord showed her the sufferings which she endured, and how greatly she had relieved by the suffrages and good works, which were daily offered for her throughout the whole order of the visitation. During the night, from Holy Thursday to Good Friday, while Sister Margaret was still praying for her, he showed her the soul of the departed as placed under the chalice which contained the sacred host on the altar of repose. There she participated in the merits of his agony in the Garden of Olives. On each Sunday, which that year fell on April 18th, Sister Margaret saw the soul enjoying the commencement, as it were, of eternal felicity desiring and hoping soon to be admitted to the vision and possession of God. Finally, a fortnight after, on May the 2nd, Sunday, Feast of the Good Shepherd, she saw the soul of the departed as rising sweetly into eternal glory, chanting melodiously the canticle of divine love. Let us see how Blessed Margaret herself gives the account of this apparition in the letter addressed on the same day, May 2, 1623, to Mother de Sumais of Dion. Jesus forever, my soul's filled with so great a joy that I can scarcely retain myself. Permit me, dear Mother, to communicate it to your heart, which is one with mine and that of our Lord. This morning, Sunday of the Good Shepherd, on awakening, 
Two of my good friends came to bid me adieu. Today the supreme pastor sees me into his eternal fold with a million other souls. Both joined this multitude of blessed souls and departed singing canticles of joy. One is the good mother for liberté, Manuel de Monteux, the other sister, Jean Catherine Gachon. One repeated unceasingly these words, Love triumphs, love rejoices in God, the other, Bless the dead who die in the Lord, and the religious who live and die in the exact observance of their rules. Both desired that I should say to you on their part that death may separate souls but can never disunite them. If you knew how my soul was transported with joy, for whilst I was speaking to them, I saw them sink by degrees into glory like a person who plunges into the vast ocean. They ask of you in thanksgiving to the Holy Trinity, one laudate, and three times gloria patri. As I desired them to remember us, their last words were that, ingratitude is unknown in heaven.